a quick run through the idea of pressure in forces, and general other scalar quantities that we need to consider. So, pressure depends on two things. How much force is applied, how hard you push, and how big the area is you're pushing over. The smaller the area, the greater the pressure, which is why you have sharp knives and stiletto heels do a lot more damage than elephants and punches in the face. Pressure can be calculated using the equation pressure is force over area. Simply means bigger force, bigger pressure, bigger area, smaller pressure. And here are some example questions. The famous one of the elephant standing on one leg. How much pressure does that exert? And the lady, a small lady of 50 kilograms standing on one, on one heel of a stiletto uh, shoe. And of course, what happens is that there's a huge amount more pressure from stiletto who because the who shoe because the area is so much smaller. That's the general thing. And you can track it through here and do the calculation yourself. Pressure in fluids acts in all directions. So it's not quite the same subject. Uh, fluids are working in all directions. So again, they're scalars. They do increase with depth. This is an illustration of what if we make a, a hole in these three parts of the can, the uh, spout at the bottom will shoot the water much greater because it's, uh, of course, at greater pressure. That's all this is really illustrating. And the poor frog feels it as he goes deeper. He gets squashed. Bang, crack, bump. Now, where it really comes into its own, this idea of pressure in fluids, is, of course, the fluid, which is the gas around the Earth, known as the atmosphere. The atmosphere lies on top of us because it is essentially a fluid, and it is pushing down on us all the time with this incredible weight. Can you feel the weight? I can feel the weight. This is called atmospheric pressure and is, of course, due to the fluid above us. Uh, 200 kilometers of it, though it's only the first you know, 30 kilometers or so, there's any sort of size in it. When you go up to 200 kilometers, you're looking at one kind of like molecule every now and again. So, uh, of course, the pressure in our bodies, our blood, uh, various other things, lymph, balance this pressure. And again, as in all the physics, balance is the important aspect. Atmospherics is proved with the famous experiment with the cup and the card. It's famous because it usually goes wrong and water spills everywhere. I am famous for doing this experiment wrong. In fact, I have lost an awful lot of uh, credibility over the years attempting this experiment in class. But basically, the card adheres to the absolutely full pitcher or glass of water as it's turned over because there is nowhere for the air to get in. And atmospheric pressure, as illustrated by the arrows, holds the card into position in a kind of a suction effect, if you like. But it's atmospheric pressure which can maintain this height of fluid. The fluid, I mean, of course, is the liquid inside the, um, the glass. Yes, exactly what I mean. Right. Next. Now, where this really comes into effect, I've said that twice now, haven't I? <laughs> is in the barometer. The barometer is a device which measures atmospheric pressure by looking at the pressure coming down in the atmosphere, the blue arrow, and using it to maintain a column of mercury's height. Now, you can also use water, but water would hold up to 10.4 metres, so that would be quite a large barometer, which would be a bit unwieldy. Because... Mercury is 13 and a half times denser than water. The column is 13 and a half times shorter and comes out to be 760 millimetres of mercury. HG is mercury. So atmospheric pressure pushes down and the column of mercury is held up by it. Now, I should point out that unlike Boyle's law experiment, which is sometimes confused with, that is a vacuum. At the top, there is no gas at all. That vacuum, called a Torricelli vacuum, after Torricelli, the pupil of Galileo, who invented this means of measuring atmospheric pressure, that Torricelli vacuum at the top there is what essentially holds up the mercury. Now, less than 760 millimetres, it will hold it all up. But when you get above 760, the mercury can only be held up to that height, so the vacuum stays in place. Now, 
what happens is if the atmospheric pressure increases, so you get more atmospheric pressure, you get more height. And if the atmospheric pressure goes down, you get less height. So by looking at the height of the mercury, you can work out what the atmospheric pressure is, because that is what's holding up this column of mercury. We can also, or we used to use this very much as an altimeter. You could go up the side of a hill and as you got further up, there was less atmospheric pressure. So the column of mercury would go down. So any um, barometer can be used to measure altitude as well as atmospheric pressure because, well, when you're at the top of the mountain up there, you're simply less air above you, less air above you, less atmospheric pressure. And by calibrating it uh, above sea level, you can uh, have a scale which tells you how high you are instead of what the atmospheric pressure is. It's just a matter of changing the little numbers on the scale. That's what we mean by calibration. These are modern uh, aneroid barometers, which work not with mercury, but with partially evacuated tubes. So it says it's a vacuum chamber. Actually, it's only partially evacuated. And what actually happens is that changes in the size of that little ridged can right at the bottom there, this thing here, that, changes in that size are noted by various clever little bits of mechanism which turn the pointer. And then we can calibrate it to whatever scale we want, either altitude or atmospheric pressure. Maybe it's easy if we look at this far simpler device on the right here. Atmospheric pressure simply pushes down on the can. When the can goes down because the atmospheric pressure is greater, the needle goes up. And when the atmospheric pressure reduces, of course, the needle goes down. It's just on a little hinge here. Now, this is nowhere near as sensitive as the item on the left, but maybe it's a better illustration of how the thing works. So, another aspect of pressure we have to learn, because this is quite often in section 12c, well, hasn't come up in a while, but it's due one, is this idea of Boyle's Law being used in calculation. Now, we'll talk about Boyle's Law in a moment, but this is basically Boyle's Law here, that's it, that the, if you change the pressure, you have to change the volume. And the multiples of the two are equal to each other. So the pressure times the volume at one point must be the pressure times the volume at another point, as long as the gas is relatively ideal, which means it's basically not too complicated in all practical senses. I mean, in the chemist will tell you that an ideal gas has, you know, virtually no mass as point, you know, all its mass at a point, you know, is doesn't interact with other molecules and bashes against the sides with perfectly elastic collisions, which of course none of those happen, but they happen close enough that you can use this in calculations. And once again, you can freeze frame here and just look through some of the type of calculations you should get. This is actually Boyle's law. Boyle was an Irishman, proud Irishman, um, was uh, an Earl of Cork, born in Lismore. Um, here is his pressure is proportional to one over volume. Um, this is famous because if you do the experiment, you have to plot pressure against one over volume to get a straight line uh, through the origin, like so many other things. And that proves that pressure is proportional to one over volume. Um, this is the way it's written actually in the logbook. Uh, if you're asked for the question, you see what you write down. You say that P is pressure and V is volume. This is the apparatus you would have used. And this is why I was talking about the trapped air earlier. In a barometer, there's a vacuum. But in this, this section here, right at the top, that is filled with air or some other gas. But air is the usual one used. And it's the volume and pressure of that gas that we're experimenting on. The oil is simply to trap the air. And the bicycle pump is to pressurise the oil, which then pressurises the air. So we read the volume of the air off of the scale on the left. And the pressure is read off of a Bourbon pressure gauge, which is down there. We also have a valve so that we can maintain the pressure, release it and maintain it, a one-way valve that we can release ourselves, and a bicycle pump, which the idea is to pressurise the uh, liquid. So we pressurise the liquid, we wait a minute, and then we read the volume from the scale and the pressure from the gauge. Now, why do we wait a minute? Anytime we compress a gas, we heat it up. Anytime we release it, depressurize it, we cool it down. 
Boyle's law only works at constant temperature. You have to state that Boyle's law is only true for constant mass and temperature. That's one of the things you have to say when you're answering the question. So you have to make sure that the gas has returned to room temperature. And for that, you simply wait a minute for the gas at the top, this tiny little piece at the top, to go back to the ambient temperature, the temperature of the room, and then you take the reading. OK, and then I've uh, thrown in this section, which is the uh, way you do it, which includes this idea of waiting 20 seconds to reach equilibrium and to return to that equilibrium again. Again, although you say you read the volume and the pressure, you actually must say you read the volume from the scale and the pressure from the pressure gauge. Now, if you plot the um, formulas you get, if you plot the, sorry, the information you get from the table there onto a graph, it will appear like that, which proves absolutely nothing. That's literally the relationship the way it looks like linearly. However, in order to prove the relationship, to prove Boyle's law, we have to convert pressure or volume, it doesn't matter, into its reciprocal, 1 over p. We write it as a decimal, and we plot that on a proper scale, there down at the bottom, against volume up the side. And that should give you a straight line through the origin. And if you remember, a straight line through the origin is the proof. A straight line through the origin is the proof. Ah, centre of gravity. Why doesn't the leaning tower of Pisa fall, fall down? Well, the short answer is the top of it's made of wood and it's very, very light. It's painted to look like stone. Only the bottom bit down here is stone. It already started to lean over when they built that much. People came to see it. They were, oh, tourist attraction. So it's probably the first, first ever purpose-built tourist attraction. Quite interesting the way that they, you know... It couldn't possibly be that it was always leaning. If you look at the lantern, the piece at the top, you can see it's standing straighter. That's because they built it like that. So when you come out at the top, when you used to be able to go up to the top of it, that you, would, um, you wouldn't sort of feel woozy or fall over or anything. Um, I do think that that's kind of a, you know, an obvious con. However, getting back to the actual business at hand about why we've got the Leaning Tower of Pisa as part of this thing, it's because the centre of gravity passes through the base. Because it's heavier at the bottom, its centre of gravity is much lower than it looks, and that's why it appears to look like it's about to fall over, but doesn't. Its centre of gravity is very low and easily passes through the base of the tower. As long as your centre of gravity passes through your base, you're fine. Problems start when your centre of gravity doesn't pass through your base. Remembering the centre of gravity is the place where all the mass appears to act. The, the centre, literally, of your mass, mathematically. You see, because if that doesn't happen, then you, you end up with problems. Here, the poor gentleman's loaded too much weight on the back of his truck. An, an obvious problem, because, I mean, if you're getting paid by the kilo, you put as much on as possible. So, the donkey has unfortunately been projected up into the air by the fact that the centre of gravity of this truck is behind the back wheel. OK, moments, also called torque, also called the laws of the lever. Also given lots of names which don't sound anything like it. I know when somebody says, what's the moment of force? And they said, oh, just a little bit of force. No, it's not. It's the force times the perpendicular distance from the fulcrum, which is here, which is where it rotates, the axis, the hinge, whatever you like, to where you put the force on, where you put your fingers on the door handle. This is a door handle. Yeah, it's a door handle. And the, yeah, you're looking at a door handle. So it's the force times the perpendicular distance. That's what you're looking at. Now, if you put these into numbers, if the force is 10 newtons and you're five meters away, you can get 50 newton meters of torque. That's a lot of torque. So basically, the longer the door handle, the more torque you're going to put on something, which is why when you're trying to lift up a car, you need a very long lever. And when, you know, you can do almost anything in nature, if you have a long enough lever, then also the lever has to hold and not sort of bend. That's the, the other thing. Now, of course, this leads us to the two laws of uh, coplanar forces. The first law is that all the forces on a body must be equal to zero if the body is in equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, all the forces must add up to zero. 
Now, if you have a rather simple body, like one that only has forces up and down, this becomes rather obvious. You simply add up all the green lines, and the missing purple line must be the result. Similarly, you can also take moments about any point. Now, the usual place to take moments about when, if not instructed, is one of the ends, because then all the numbers here become easier to calculate. You have 10, 50, 60, 70, 90 as, as the distances. Moments, as we saw on the last slide, is the distance from the fulcrum, over here, fulcrum, to the point where the force is acting. And it's the perpendicular distance. You must be very careful about this. And we'll talk about this in a moment when we look at the experiment. So the first to work out the uh, first law of coplanar forces, you simply add up the forces up and the forces down, and that can tell you what the missing number is. So up here must be 20 newtons, because that's the only force that will balance them. Of course, I've assumed that this five newtons is the weight of the object, as well as the weight of the things on it. But basically, forces up must be equal to force with forces down. That's the first law of coplanar forces. The second law of moments, also known as the law of the lever, is we simply multiply all the distances by all the forces, as long as they are perpendicular, which you can see from the diagram they are. So, for instance, the first one is 10 centimetres from the fulcrum A and is 15 newtons. So we get 10 times 50. There, you see. And we do it for all of them. Take another one, for instance, the 5 times 90, for instance. 5 times 90, can we find that? There. Now, there are all the forces going down the green arrows. The purple arrows are going up. So you have uh, 60 times 15. There we are. And the unknown times the 20 we worked out in the previous slide. And from that, we can find the unknown is 32.5. So, of course, this is in the wrong place. It should be over here at 32.5. But it doesn't matter. You've merely illustrated it on the diagram. This is merely a guidance to help you. But it would be normally there. And if you think about the 20 newtons balancing this thing, you would expect it not to be at the very end, but closer to the fulcrum for a balance to happen. This leads us to the law or the experiment we do, which I'm not particularly looking forward to trying to recreate at home. You might have seen some of my YouTube channel videos. This one's not going to be very easy. <laughs> but the two Newton balances are basically holding the meter rule horizontal so that all of the distances are perpendicular. It's got to be horizontal because the distances have to be perpendicular. Otherwise, you just use trigonometry to work out the distance. In order to not use trigonometry, you have to keep the ruler absolutely horizontal so that the forces are acting at 90 degrees to it. Also, it has to be absolutely still so that the, all the forces acting on it are in equilibrium. It can also obviously be moving up or down with constant velocity, but that would be a rather difficult experiment to do. So we tend to keep it stationary. So to summarise, forces up equals forces down, and the sum of the clockwise moments of equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. And this, as I said, is called the law of the lever. And it also defines the moment of force as force times the perpendicular distance. The last thing to discuss is a couple. Now this, you know, nice couple. Um, yeah, yeah, we had dinner with them last night, a nice couple. No, a tap or a bicycle uh, handlebars are a couple. You push in both directions at once. And uh, simply to work out the moment of a couple, you multiply one of the forces, because they have to be equal if you're putting equal force on the two, times their distance apart. That's the force of a couple. Now, if you're asked about a couple, this diagram plus, um, you know, the uh, writing here, moment is force times distance like that, is plenty. But a couple is two equal forces, such as turning on a tap when you're pushing in two directions at once. And this is the one I've set you. This is an experiment from 2013. There were several, actually. There was another in 2014, which just proves that the experiments can repeat themselves. And you have to be aware of all the experiments, particularly the ones that were, uh, haven't come up for a long time and the ones that were on last year. You need to, those are the ones that are most important. So here we have all the information you need. You have to do both forces up and forces down and the moments 
left and right. And you also have to say how you found the centre of gravity by balancing it on your finger. That's how you found the centre of gravity and how you found the mass of the metre stick, which was using a digital scale. I very much like you to do this question and be happy with it in case it comes up, because I think of all the mechanics questions, this is possibly the most likely.